Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Dish with River City Opera. My name is Jessica Harika, and I'm the artistic director and co-founder of RCO. We are absolutely thrilled that you have joined us this evening um, while we envision the future of opera, and, uh, and we chat tonight with our expert about how we incorporate audience DEI initiatives into your organization. If you enjoy yourself this evening, we invite you to visit our website, rivercityopera.org slash donate, where you can make a completely tax deductible donation to RCO. We want to ensure that programming like this is made possible in the future. And with that, let's get started. Our host this evening, Elliot Page, hails from right here in Virginia. Elliot is a graduate of the Manhattan School of Music where he received his Master of Music in Opera Performance and is also an alumnus of James Madison University where he received a Bachelor of Music in Vocal Performance. He is the second place winner of the 2015 Allen and Job AIDS Vocal Competition, was a scholarship recipient at the Manhattan School of Music and was awarded Best Male Classical Singer for Virginia and the Virginia National Association of Teachers of Singing Competition. As a child, he was a member of the Richmond Boys Choir, where he made his Kennedy Center debut in Washington, DC, and he has also sung for former First Lady Laura Bush at the Smithsonian Art Museum. He has been seen with Opera Parallel, Palm Beach Opera, the Glimmer Glass Festival, the Opera Theater of St. Louis, Semper Oper Dresden, Kölner Philharmonic, München Deutsches Theater, Hamburg Staatsoper, Alta Oper Frankfurt, and Chautauqua Opera. Most recently, Elliot was seen and heard as an apprentice artist with Santa Fe Opera. I am so proud this evening to welcome our host of The Dish, Mr. Elliot Page. Hello, how are Good you? Good evening, how are you, darling? <laughs> I'm doing fabulous, thank you, thank you. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to you, take her away. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Hello, good evening. Uh, so tonight we have a very special treat. We have Miss Donna Walker Kuhn, who is an amazing DEI advocate and uh, a forerunner in this uh, area of specialty. So she's acknowledged as the nation's foremost expert in audience development by the Arts Business Council. Donna Walker Kuhn has devoted her professional career to increasing access to the arts. She's raised over $20 million in earned income promoting the arts to multicultural communities. She's currently Vice President of Community Engagement at New Jersey Performing Arts Center, charged with developing and deepening relationships with targeted communities through partnerships, special events, and group sales. She was formerly Vice President of Marketing and Communications for New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Donna is also the founder of Walker International Communications Group, a boutique marketing press and audience development consulting agency. Her team specializes in multicultural marketing, group sales, multicultural press, and promotional events. A veteran of over 18 Broadway productions, she most recently provided the multicultural marketing and group sales for A Raisin in the Sun, A Streetcar Named Desire, The Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk, Stick Fly, Time Stand Still, Driving Miss Daisy, and Ragtime. Her clients also include Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, the Apollo Theater, WNYC Radio, New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and the Louis Armstrong House Museum. She was an associate producer of George C. Wolfe's Harlem Song at the Apollo Theater and co-producer for the 2004 AUDELCO Awards. She is co-founder of Impact Broadway, a socially and technologically driven audience development initiative starting, excuse me, serving 300 African-American and Latino students throughout the five boroughs of New York City. She was formerly Director of Marketing and Audience Development for the Public Theater and Director of Marketing for Dance Theater of Harlem. Ms. Walker Kuhn is the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2015 Community Service Award from Women in Media, the 2012 Women of Excellence Award from the National, excuse me, from the Network Journal, and the 2009 Brooklyn College Managers for the Arts Salute Award. She is an adjunct professor of New at New York University and Bank Street College. She serves on several boards, including the National Theater Conference, Newark Arts Council, and the Harlem Arts Alliance. She is vice chair of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, Arts, Culture, and Entertainment Committee, and her groundbreaking first book, Invitation to the Party, Building Bridges to Arts, Culture, and Community, make sure you check that out, <laughs> was published in 2005. It's my pleasure to introduce our main guest this evening, Ms. Donna Walker-Kuhn. Thank you. Thank I you. Love, love. 
Great to be here. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for uh, coming in and sharing uh, this amazing and powerful information with us tonight. We really appreciate you being here. Welcome. Thank you. So I believe, you know, just in starting, you know, the conversation about how we engage diverse audiences, I think the first thing is that we have to become pioneers of a better age, you know, and that means that we you know, really have to look at how do we use the time we have now uh, to be able to create a humanistic society. So one of my mentors uh, is uh, Daisaku Ikeda. And he, he said, you know, uh, to become pioneers of a better age, it means that there's no other solution to the problem of racial discrimination than realizing the human revolution in each individual. In other words, an inner reformation in the depths of people's lives to transform the egoism that justifies the subjugation of others and replace it with the humanism that strives for coexistence among all people. So I believe we have to have a philosophical context for this. You know, there's got to be a foundation. And there's some great um, uh, quotes from leadership in the field that are also encouraging us to look at things, you know, um, in this way. And so um, one of the points I really think is important is to create brave spaces. And so brave spaces is where people of diverse backgrounds feel the freedom to express themselves, um, to not be punished uh, for their point of view, you know, to really be able to do their work in a safe place. And so Dr. Indira Atwaro, she talks about this and how to contribute to engaging diverse communities, um, dealing with empowering internally the staff so that the culture is one where you can speak freely without fear of repercussions and creating a brave space to create change. So if you think about the civil rights movement and of course now the most recent um, you know, racial protests, that's coming from a place of bravery and courage. And that's what we wanna build inside of our arts organizations. And then Darren Walker, who is the head of the Ford Foundation, you know, he's a strong advocate for diversity. I love what he says. He says, diversity for me is about excellence. I think regrettably diversity was framed by some and continues to be framed in a way that suggests that diversity correlates with the loss of quality. And actually what the research shows, empirical evidence is that diversity makes organizations better. The more diverse the organizations are, the more excellent they are at whatever they do. And so he says, I don't talk about diversity without talking about excellence. Diversity is a contributor to excellence. So these are really powerful statements that you know create a, a framework. And so essentially, I think in all of our arts organizations, we wanna create a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So these are questions that you should ask yourself. Who can effectuate change and integration of diversity on all platforms in the arts world? What? is the goal for diversity and at what level? And how many people of color have engagement at the senior level with the authority to make decisions? Always recognizing that this work is long-term. So we, we have to focus on the fact that this work never stops. So there's no there there. You're not gonna like say, oh, okay, we finally got it because the world keeps changing and evolving. There's different ways of defining EDIA. People come in and leave and they all bring their own stuff with that. So this is an ongoing process. And it's important that our colleagues and partners, that they have you know, close relationships with us and they understand that they are positively reshaping our internal work culture. So building this culture of diversity is about how to be as inclusive as possible and we can do this on all levels, from the vendors we work with, the artists that we hire, the productions that we choose to present, what media do we cultivate, and how do we market it? All of those are really important areas that we can look at. And then, you know, making sure that we keep this at the forefront of our work. So this isn't something you just pull out every now and then. This actually has to drive the way we do business. So it requires a whole different way of thinking you know, and how do we um, execute this in a, in a respectful and harmonious way. So some of the ways we can stay focused on this is one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, that we have regularly with the leadership of the organization, 
to expand upon information gathered, you know, as you're learning and reading, for instance, whatever you take away from today's session, then you take that back to your organization and say, I was as part of this uh, conference, you know, or this workshop, and I heard some really interesting points. What do you think about that? You know, so that keeps you kind of current. And then, you know, of course, we're in a quarantine, but when we come out, you can, we can certainly have lunch and learn sessions, you know, where we're, you know, always sharing, learning, sharing, dialogue. <clears throat> and one of the points that's important to remember, lean into the uncomfortable. This is not going to be, you know, like kumbaya. It's not. It is changing fundamental beliefs. It's looking at microaggressions. It's looking at uprooting, disrupting racism, sexism, and all other forms of injustice in the workplace. And so we have to be open to experience this discomfort in an honest way. So you have to push yourself to communicate candidly about difficult topics. Apologize, admit your mistakes and blind spots, and express gratitude when someone corrects you. So you want to listen to people who have been injured or silenced and commit to do to do better. You know, these are you know really important points. And so you know we want to look at in the field of classical music because that's one of the genres that we're discussing. And we know that you know there's been a number of communications that have come from uh, artists of color uh, to leadership in the classical music field. You know citing specific instances of racist behavior. And so we have to look at that. You know, this is not the time to kind of put your head down and pretend it doesn't exist. And so, you know, I think this is a really important moment to look at what, what does that mean? Who am I hiring? What works are we choosing? Is it always the same? Always the same. You know, um, there's a series of articles that have been documenting racism in classical music. And one of these, you know, is an example, an artist had, had uh, pointed out, he said that he was encouraged to switch instruments uh, to a trombone because it, he was told the size of his lips would impact his playing, you know? And so individuals in classical music leadership roles have the power to act as gatekeepers to talented artists of color, but the attitudes of the patrons and board members can be just as uh, you know, negative to the overall health of the industry. And so we really have to look at this holistically. I remember working on the production of uh, Margaret Garner when it was at, uh, presented by New York City Opera at the Met Theater. And one of the, um, you know, we had a wonderful campaign. It was great because my company was hired to do the marketing uh, to really bring an African-American audience. And we did a lot of things over the summer. We did festivals, we, you know, really talked about the content. We did, you know, digital campaigns, advertising, even hired an African-American caterer for opening night, which was unprecedented. But my audiences, when we got the people there, my audiences would call me after and say, the, the production was great, but I was so uncomfortable. You know, as I went to sit down, people would look at me as like, why are you here? Or, you know, pull their coats closer. And, you know, just they felt so unwelcomed. And so that's the part that marketing can't control is how our audiences will respond. And so that's why this really has to be a holistic effort. And so <clears throat> some of the key points, you know, we have to get over the fear of talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have to think about what are the biggest barriers to our success? It's usually ourselves. We get in the way. But we have to show courage, not just in what we ask, but how we listen. Educate yourself on the issues. If you are a white person, you should be reading many, many books, articles, watching films. You have to educate yourself and not rely on people of color to do that for you. This is your responsibility. We have to lean into the uncomfortable. And of course, confronting racism is not about the needs and feelings of white people. It's about correcting, you know, an unjust society. And so we all have to take action, you know, to do that. And so, you know, this culture of EDI is, is right now, it is the number one topic in the arts world. <clears throat> I would say across all genres, dance, theater, visual arts, certainly classical music, you know, it's just really, you know, just really grown. And I think, of course, you all would agree that what has really you know, accelerated this was the murder of George Floyd. And so at that point, you can no longer deny that there is clearly racist, systemic racism in our society. And that we see people really protesting about that to change this, to uproot this. 
So one of the concepts that I think is important to understand is the concept of white fragility. And this is something that, you know, Robin DiAngelo writes about in her, her book. Um, and <clears throat> she talks about this, you know, as a form of defensiveness, argumentation, certitude, other forms of pushback. And she says these are social forces that prevent us from attaining the racial knowledge we need to engage more productively. And they function powerfully to hold the racial hierarchy in place. So, you know, we have to understand what these various terminologies mean. What is racism, white supremacy? We hear this a lot, you know, unconscious bias, microaggression. Really have to deep, uh, dive deep into, you know, understanding what they mean, but more importantly, how they operate in our society. And one point that I think is important is also understanding the difference between prejudice, um, discrimination, and racism. And something she points out that discrimination is action based on prejudice. You know, so these actions include ignoring someone, excluding them from something, threats, ridicule, slander. Racism is when a racial group's collective prejudice is backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control. That's when it becomes racism because now it's systemic. And now there's, you know, there's a power base behind it. And so understanding these, this, this, these um, differences, I think, is really, really important. Um, she also talks about the fact that racism is a structure, not an event. So it's not like, oh, I think I'll be racist today. No, it's all part of a system. And so, you know, it's, it's clearly it's behavioral and it's cultural. And of course, everyone has prejudice and discriminates. Everyone. We all have an ism in our life. But structures of oppression go well beyond individuals. So racism, because it's systemic, like sexism, occurs when this prejudice is backed by legal authority and institutional control. And these are all points that are really important to, to understand. You have to know what it is that we're talking about. So, you know, of course, people of color will hold, uh, you know, prejudice about different people, different behaviors, a different lifestyle. But we don't have the legal authority to really implement that, you know, and it's more uh, behavioral. And so um, that, that becomes something that I think is really, really significant. And so we want to talk about, so what can we do? How do we change this? Um, you know, and I believe everything starts with ourself. So in terms of action steps, I would suggest that as organizations, because the focus today is, you know, looking at organizations, I would say first, you know, use your social media and online platforms uh, to underscore your support of justice for communities of color and cultural institutions of color. Talk about that, you know, and you can post, you know, we support. I'm sure many of you watching uh, did the posting of standing in solidarity for Black Lives Matter. Um, because those, you know, were posted by the hundreds of thousands. But now we have to go beyond that. Okay, so now you said we support that. Okay, but what's next? So you can advocate, you know, for funding to multicultural arts organizations. That's not going to take away from you. That is going to, to indicate that you are aware that there's an inequity in how funding is allocated. And you're now taking a stand about that. Create a welcoming place. You know, for those of you who have spaces so that people of color feel welcome coming there and not just for Black History Month or, you know, Latino Heritage Month, but all the time, all 12 months of the year, a person of color can walk in and feel welcomed. Um, that's something you really have to be conscious about. Um, other action steps you can take as organization, join social and civic groups that address social injustice like the NAACP or the National Urban League or Black Lives Matter, you know, and so really, you know, make that commitment individually as well as as an organization. So right now, the two key issues that we're facing in this country is voter registration and census completion. And both of those have direct impact on people of color. And so as an organization, you can help advocate for that. You can post. Please register to vote. Make it a campaign. Have a table in your, well, we can't have a table in our lobby, but definitely make it a campaign through our posting, through the various events that you're doing. Even if it's just a tagline on the bottom, don't forget to vote. Don't forget to complete the census. The census has a direct impact on communities of color because without that data, 
we don't get the resources. We don't get the hospitals. We don't get the police protection. We don't get the schools, the quality of all of those things are directly impacted by completing the census. So those are really important. And then of course the pipeline, you know, what are you doing internally? So every organization should have a pipeline for leadership and it should include diversity, equity and inclusion. So how are we making sure we are including various kinds of individuals with different backgrounds? So not everyone has to have gone to an Ivy League, you know, to be able to sing a particular work. You know, people may have been self-taught. People may have a different way of developing that experience. But as long as you feel the standard is there, then there should be an openness for that. So we need these pipelines internally for administration as well as for performing. Um, and so I think that the hiring uh, component is crucial. Also on board of directors, you know, so who said board of directors can only have one or two people of color? So the board needs to reflect the communities in which you live. And so whatever that looks like, that should be the representation on your board. So think about the different kinds of currency. Not all of it has to be green. And so perhaps the people of color you may want to hire may not have the financial resources uh, to contribute as a board member, but they bring experience, they bring connections, they bring partnership. That has a dollar value because that's something that's been developed over the years. And so we have to change the criteria on eligibility for board leadership, board membership. And then all of you have the opportunity to be an ally. And so this allyship is something that's really been growing, the idea of it, and we've seen it in these racial protest movements where we've seen many, many white people marching along with people of color, with their signs, you know, Black Lives Matter. That's so important. We need allies, we need everyone to create this culture of EDI. So for an organization, you know, um, your leadership, you play a pivotal role in how you help your staff understand their role in support. And so you know, it's important that leadership speak out and say that as an organization, we are taking a stand to really support our communities of color. And these are the three things that we're going to do. You know, but if you proceed with this business as usual, kind of ignoring what's going on, it definitely sends a message to your staff of color that you don't care. Um, and so then you kind of wonder what is the commitment that you expect from them. So you really want to think about how can I be an ally, where I stand. And remember, lean into the uncomfortable. It's always it's, it's a guarantee that this is not going to feel like, you know, going to the ice cream parlor. When you start to feel that, then you know you're on the right path. So the way forward is looking at, you know, these various examples that I gave you of how you can be proactive, but also to think individually and personally, what commitment can I make, you know, that I can actually execute? And then what is the measurable action step? So there's accountability in this EDI work. You know, it's not just, yeah, we had a workshop and we're good. Uh, no, that's actually not what we're going to do. So we, measurable action means there's accountability. And so that can come from the leadership or it can come from the staff. It can come from the community. But there has to be a metric that says you're moving forward or you're not. There's, there's no middle ground. It's either we're advancing this initiative or we're not doing anything. And so that's what's so important when we think about how to move forward. And just remember, those who can shape this time will benefit by those who can imagine it. So I want each of you to visualize, what would this look like? Wow, what can I create? You know, how much of myself can I really uh, put into this, uh, you know, to really create a completely different kind of, 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 you know, humanity and community? I think this is the time to do that. And there are no shortcuts. So this is not just going to read a couple of books and I'm good. There's no shortcuts or a silver bullet to enable inclusive workplaces. But you can send a powerful message as an ally in a position of power and influence when you're the one who takes up the work. So lead by example. So for leadership to not just tell the staff, you should do this, you should take this course, you should read this book, lead by example and say, I just saw this, I just read this, I just heard this, and wow, it's really life-changing, and I encourage you to do the same. So that's how we can also you know, start to really change the way we um, think, but also our behavior. And then let's make sure we're optimistic. 
you know? So we're all champions for the arts. So let's use that platform to touch the lives of others. And, you know, to really remember that art calls to the optimism within us and beckons us to breathe. That's a quote from Alva DuVernay that I love. I think that is uh, so beautiful. And so, yes, this is difficult and challenging, but that doesn't mean we can't be optimistic. That doesn't mean that there's no hope, you know, that we can be um, transformative in, in our work. So, you know, let's just do our best to share our thoughts and feelings as calmly and concisely as possible, you know, to not think I have to change this person. That's not the approach to EDI, that I'm changing you. I'm actually changing myself. And as a result of that transformation, my environment will change. And in the end, the actions were driven by your need for integrity, not the need to correct or change someone else. So again, you go back to the root. What is the root of your thinking? Why is this so important? You know, we talked about creating a humane society, about the integrity and dignity of each person's life. Not to just be able to check off and say, oh, we did that. It's much, much deeper than that. You know, and so these are just some of the, the factors, some of the qualities, um, you know, that I think we need to think about to be able to apply this. Um, I know that, you know, there's a lot of different forms of training that people are exploring. There's, you know, the um, unconscious bias training. <clears throat> there's external training on racial equity. There's internal facilitated discussions, um, comprehensive orientation programs, staff policies and procedures. And so all of these are things you can think about as you look at your organization, even if it's a one person organization, that's fine. There's still the platform and the need to make sure there's equity, diversity, and inclusion, because it's not just, again, in the staff that you work with, but it's also the community, you know, that you are cultivating and how you're cultivating. What is the language? What does the leadership look like? And so I know that in the classical world, you know, there's so many questions about how come we don't have more diverse audiences. And the media answer is very simple. It's because of, one, the work that you choose to present, you know, and so the idea of what is classical you know, there's an expansion that needs to happen in that conversation. So it's not just white composers, uh, you, know, um, you know, that define what is classical, but there are many, many uh, cultures that have existed way before, you know, 15th, 16th century that are classical in their work as well. So I believe when there's a shift in how we define what classical music is, we'll see a shift in participation and engagement. But right now it's, it's a perceived as elite, you know, and exclusive and for the privileged few. So why should I do that? And at the same time, please don't think that because uh, you don't have diverse audiences, those people are suffering or that they're um, underserved. They're doing just fine. They have chosen other kinds of cultural experiences and it's just not you. So fundamentally, you have to do the work. Everyone has to take responsibility to transform their organizations, but also themselves. And I believe from that place is where we're going to really see enormous changes in our world, um, in the way we engage with each other. And the arts will benefit in such a significant way. So I'm excited about what's ahead. I'm excited to be a part of this process. And I really appreciate the opportunity and inv invitation from you know, opera to be able to be able to speak with you um, this evening. So I'm going to turn it back over to our host. Thank you. Yes. Oh my goodness. Thank yeah. you so much. What what a comprehensive <laughs> explanation of things that we. I mean, I mean, just from looking at your book <laughs> and reading your book, you know, you go in into detail into yeah. some of the ideas that you're talking about. And if, if anybody, listen, <laughs> if you wanna know how to do it, go out, invitation to the party. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can speak about your experience um, in, in all of the different facets of the arts, like being a dance, dancer, yep. attorney, marketing, professor, audience development specialist, um, and how has that informed sure. some of your strategies uh, throughout so, the time you working know, in um, I grew up in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago. So 
<laughs> growing up in the 60s, right. I was uh, very much encouraged not to go around white people or trust white people. And so that was my uh, cultural upbringing. Mm. Um, at the same time, I, my mother had taken me to see the Bolshoi Ballet, and I fell in love with ballet, and Maya Pleskovskaya was the reigning prima ballerina, and I just said, I'm going to be like her. So my mom enrolled my sister and I in dance classes, so we, we started dancing, and uh, the, ultimately we joined an African dance company, and we started performing, and you know, having some really great experiences, and then it occurred to me, so wait a minute, I don't know any dancers that are making a living performing. I'm going to law school because I need a paycheck. So I went to law school <laughs> and I, I performed throughout law school and did choreography. I went to Howard University in DC and then I graduated and moved to New York. And so I practiced law for two years, um, family court prosecuting juveniles, um, but that was not fulfilling for me and I really missed dance. And so across the street, from Brooklyn Family Court um, is the um, was an organization called the Thelma Hill Performing Arts Center, presenting arts organization, one man running the whole thing. And I went over there one day on my lunch hour <laughs> and seeing all these papers on the floor, the file drawers half open, I said, I'll come on my lunch hour and help you organize. I'll just come and I'm gonna volunteer. But what I did was I started to teach myself how to be an arts administrator. And then I noticed he was booking these big events. He did Big Bowl Blacken in Brooklyn. You did women in jazz, women in dance. And I thought, wow, these people are coming here. They should have something to do. I wonder how I could connect them with the community. So it was back then that I started thinking about people being engaged with the community. Then I wrote a letter to Arthur Mitchell at the Dance Theater of Harlem, and he hired me, and I began doing the marketing. <clears throat> One of the key questions Arthur Mitchell asked me was, as we toured around the nation, where are the black audiences? That was a very specific question he asked me. So I asked the presenters, where are the black audiences? And they said, we're trying to get them. We don't quite know how. And so that's when I started to craft this national audience development task force. And that would be going out to various cities that we were on tour in advance and working with community leaders to build a committee that would take responsibility to promote the performances in advance of our performing. And that really was amazing. And I got to know so many different people around the country and found that there's such common denominators when you invite someone to participate, when you honor their experience and their relationships, it's limitless what they will do you know, to support that. So that, that's the foundation of my work. And it's just extended from the public theater to Broadway uh, to my company that I have now. Wow, that is amazing. Um, wow. <laughs> That's a great way to get kind of introduced into, you know, kind of like, I, I think now your life's work. Um, also, just FYI, for the people who are watching, please feel free to write any comments or questions you may have for Miss Donna Walker Kuhn. We will be taking a little question portion at the end. So if you have any questions, please make sure you write them in the comment box below. Um, so one of the things that you touched on just even a, a few seconds ago was mm -hmm. a kind of diversity in audience. What do you... Um, Okay. Makes a diverse So audience. there's two approaches. Um, my book that you referenced, and thank you so much, uh, Invitation to the Party, I wrote that book right after um, the Broadway production of Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk. And it was because we had had such success in bringing in African-American audience to Broadway. At that time, there was not a lot of examples of that. And the producers kept asking me, how did you do it? So I said, I'll write it down. So that's how I wrote the book. I wrote it in three weeks. George Wolf gave me three weeks. He said, you want to write a book? You got three weeks. I said, okay, we're on. And I, you know, I approached it like the bar exam. I got up at four in the morning and I just wrote all day, wrote all day. Um, and so, but that book focuses on audience development and that is developing strategies for target audience for transactional relationship. So the transaction is that they're going to buy a ticket or they're going to come to your event. That's the expectation. That's the measurement of success. So throughout the book are case studies on how I did that in various ways from dance to theater, you know, to, to Broadway. I just completed my second book, uh, which is called Champions for the Arts. And that book is specifically focused on community engagement. 
So that's the evolution of audience development. You know, audience development was very popular in the 80s and 90s, but since about 2012, 2013, our organizations have really been looking at community engagement, which is a different definition of engaging diverse audiences. So it's not transactional. It does not have attached to it a ticket purchase. What it does do is create access to the arts. That's what community engagement is. So that allows us to be much more uh, broad-based in ex expanding our work. And also, expectation doesn't have to be I sold a ticket. Success is that they came, they tried a new dance workshop, or they came to another jazz jam, or they said, you know, I'm out of their neighborhood and they came by access. We want people to know this is what you have. What you choose to do, that's your decision. So that's community engagement. Some examples of that I'm doing at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. And, and by the way, I'm a consultant at NJPAC. I'm not the VP anymore. I'm consulting because I have um, many, many projects and clients. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm a consultant there. Uh, and so at, at NJPAC, you know, I created the community engagement department there um, close to six years ago. And in this department, what we have done was to look at the mission of the Arts Center to see how could we expand that to engage the local Newark community, predominantly African-American, who were not coming into the Arts Center in a very significant way. And so we looked at um, classical music, we looked at dance, and we looked at um, jazz. And of course, those are the ones that are challenging to sell tickets for, but they also what makes us an Arts Center. That's our mission. And so, you know, we developed a dance committee, uh, advisory committee made up of, of choreographers and dancers from Jersey. And they suggested, you know, they said, make this place a, a home for dance, play with it, bring it out to the community. And I know that as being a dancer, it's difficult to sell uh, a dance performance. And most people feel a little threatened, like, I don't know what that is, or what is that modern dance? And people, it's no music, people look like they're in pain, I don't want to see that, you know, and so, or I don't know, Swan Lake, I don't, you know, some classical work, so they just don't come. And so we use our, our asked our dance artists to do dance workshops, which we've been able to pivot those since the quarantine, and they're all online. So every Wednesday at NJPAC, we have Wellness Wednesdays, different dance styles. We do Bhangra, Bollywood, West African, we've done yoga, we've done voguing, we've done liturgical, ballet, modern. Um, and we just continue, you know, creating these platforms for people to enjoy dance. And so by having this access to it, we know that's going to translate to you being curious when you want to go see a full performance. But you do it on your own time instead of me driving you to do it because I have a sales goal to meet. That's, mm -hmm. that's that, that difference. Same with jazz, you know, when we were presenting these big jazz events, we had a big moody jazz festival, but, you know, so many people told me, they said, you know, we like jazz in an intimate way, you know, not 3,000 feet, but can you make it a little smaller, like at a club, and so have a jazz jam, so we started doing those, so we've been doing, presenting jazz jams now for four years um, in a beautiful club in Newark that's always completely packed. What I love about it is the diversity of who comes. We have, you know, students from Rutgers. We have jazz, you know, lovers. We have, you know, people who are curious. We have a Newarker. So it's racially, ethnically, incredibly diverse and definitely by age. And you've got seasoned jazz artists who are like the house band. And then you've got students and emerging jazz artists. And so it becomes a way to look at jazz in an accessible way that's not on the big stage, but it's right in front of you and it's people that you know. And so we developed a series of these kind of programs, you know, to engage our community that allow, now allows us to really see diversity uh, on a very fundamental level. Mm, wow. So one of the things that you um, kind of touched on was getting out and creating connections. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do right now, right? Because we're in this yeah. pandemic. We have COVID-19 happening. You know, what yeah. when performances aren't possible, what can or art our or our art <laughs> organizations <laughs> do to promote the arts? Um, I know you just mentioned a, an example of the the Wednesdays that you have at the NJ Art Center, but are there mm -hmm. other examples that you would think that could um, kind of influence uh, our time now having to be sure. kind of in the house? I think film screenings. 
mm -hmm. uh, are excellent, followed by panel discussions. I think you can make them very topical. You know, what is it everyone's talking about right now? They're looking at EDI. They're looking at disrupting racism. They're looking at many different aspects of this. Um, and so many films are available on PBS. There's some documentaries, you know, but also sometimes like um, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, for a month they'll show certain films for free um, that you don't have to be a member of. So it requires some research, but I think you can construct a series of programs that include dialogue films, that include performances, workshops, that include, you know, um, opportunities for people to just talk about what's interesting. I think you can also look back into what you may have recorded in terms of performances and start to show that as a way of building and engaging audiences and work with specific organizations. So, I, I, you know, at NJPAC, we have 120 engaged partners. Those are organizations wow. and individuals we work with that we've cultivated one by one. So to your point, it's more challenging now to get new partners, but you can certainly start to reach out to the civic, cultural, educational, and faith-based organizations that are there locally and ask them, what are you interested in? Because I believe the arts can translate exactly what's going on in our society. And so by asking that question, you then allow them to tell you, well, you know, we're trying to teach our young people about civic responsibility, or we're trying to really advocate voter registration. So as an arts organization, how can you respond to that? This is where you get to be creative and not just press the usual button that you're accustomed to. You know, and then surround yourself with people who can help you craft this, build an advisory committee. We can do this over Zoom, you know, StreamYard, right. whatever the platform right. is. So think about the, the champ, champions who have come to your performances. I love what you do. Subtext, use me. What else can I do? What else can I do? And so that, along with people that you would like to work with, put that together and start to have some brainstorming dialogue and say, you know, let's, how can we be more responsive? What else can we do based on a very limited budget or one person that can execute this? So this is not about doing a thousand things. It's about choosing what you can do and do it brilliantly because you have to make that impact. You want to create the footprint that your organization is actually making a difference, however you can do that. Awesome. And, you know, we have, we're talking about organizations and we're talking about companies, but we have, you know, quite a range of, of companies, whether they be small companies, large companies. And I think that some of the small companies that are newer companies are doing really well with trying to incorporate EDI into their, yeah. into their kind of basis of their statement. Right. Mm -hmm. But how can small companies without you know, the big resources to hire outside consultants and invest right. in those DEI initiatives from kind of from the start? There are so many resources that are now available online. I mean, I'm, I, every day I'm just trying to grab things that I, I read. And so I think it's just like you create a pedagogy for how you approach the music, build a curriculum, how I'm going to develop EDIA culture in my organization. And so where do you start? I start with definitions, unpack it. What does it mean? What does equity mean? Diversity, inclusion. And then I add the A, accessibility, mm -hmm. because that's also a very important piece. And not just the physical part, but it's also how people experience the arts. So some people are in different uh, places, you know, and in their lives and how they can hear and participate. So we want to make sure that the work is accessible to as many people as possible. So I would do the research, you know, and then start to roll out. OK, this week we're going to read this book and we're going to talk about it. And let's take two or three things we can build from out of this book. And then you have to push yourself because the other part of your brain is saying, yeah, but we got to get this work up. We have to or we have to raise money or we have to do all those other things. Yes. But now this has to be interwoven into the culture of how you do business. So this isn't a question of not doing it. This is a question of how do I connect this to what I've committed myself to do? So it, it all kind of knits together. Um, so I think that's the place that anyone can start. It's all, information is free online. Right. Information is free online. And there's, some great, there's some great places to go. The Schomburg Center uh, for uh, Black Culture, they have a great resource page on their website. Uh, NJPAC, mm -hmm. 
NJPAC has a great um, website uh, um, information. We call it Standing and Solidarity. And on that page, we have a list of books, articles, films, and documentaries. And, and many other cultural organizations too as well. The NAACP uh, has that. So the research is the information out there. Definitely, definitely. Now, what are some what are like what are what are some of the roadblocks that you've kind of encountered um, to engaging with diverse audiences, and and what can communities do on a on a community level to combat these challenges? What what type of things do you see come up often that are you know interfere with that? History, history, the history yeah. that organization has had with that community, mm -hmm. and the lack of apology or acknowledgement. Wow. That's really important, very, very important. People don't forget. And so, you know, it becomes a question of, well, they don't, no one reached out to me before, or they did a work that was culturally offensive, and we spoke to them about it, and they still chose to do it. Mm. Or I noticed that their, you know, their leadership, no one there looks like me. You know, their marketing materials does not refer to me. Um, so... Those, those are things that are right in front of you. They're like right in front of your face. Um, and so you have to acknowledge that. So the first thing you have to do is apologize mm. and say, yes, you're right. This is, this was unacceptable. This is, you know, and I'm here to change it. You know, so not to drag it out and go through this long soliloquy about why it happened. Apologize <laughs> and move forward. You say, you know, you're right. And we're going to change it starting now. And I need your help. Will you help me? You know, and so and speak from your heart. You know, you don't have to try to make it all pretty and cover it up. Sometimes it's just ugly, you know, right. and, and, and you have to admit that. There have been some horrible instances where people have really been made to feel less than, to feel unwelcome. And you have to acknowledge that, yeah, I, I, I either didn't pay attention or I was part of that process. Even when I arrived at the public theater, you know, um, there used to be a Latino um, festival there, and there was an expectation it would continue with George C. Wolf being there and under his leadership. Well, that was one of the things that George cut. One, it was a million dollar initiative, and he said, you know, looking at the budget, I've got a streamline. But two, he just felt that we're going to celebrate the Latino culture throughout the season. I don't have to have a designated festival for that. We're going to do these plays continuously by Latino playwrights. So when I started to go out into the community and meet leadership from the Latino community, that was the first thing they would ask me. Why did you cut the festival? What happened? You know, and so I didn't even know about the festival. I had to run back to the office and say, tell me about the festival. What happened? You know, because I can't get past that to have a, a conversation. Because people are really upset about it. And so once I got the answers, I then could use that. I could get in front of it. And, and so I could say, thank you for meeting with me. I know one of your burning questions is about the Latino festival, but let me explain to you why we've chosen not to do it and how we're still going to be acknowledging the rich culture that you have. So with the knowledge, I could get in front of it. Um, so I, I know what this is. And also with the American Indian Community House, which is across the street from the public. You know, I had worked with them when I was at Dan Theater of Harlem on a ballet. And so I just couldn't wait to get over there. I was like, remember, <laughs> Donna, you know, we worked together at DTH. And they just stood there and I said, huh. the public theater has been across the street for 40 years. No one has ever come here. I said, but I just started last week. So I'm here now. So let's see, what can we do to play together? So I had to earn their trust, you know, and I did that by just being sincere by making proposals of different things we could do. We just, we incubated their women's uh, theater group um, so that we they could take advantage of our dramaturgy department. You know, we did some cultural exchange programs. We offered discounts to all of their members and staff. So we created a menu of how we could engage them. But that took time. None of this stuff is easy. None of this takes it happens in five minutes. So you really have to be committed and understand it's a long-term process and you have to be committed and continue to advance with your heart leading the way. People respond to sincerity and truth. It's the BS that we're done with. Right. Done with that. Right. One hundred percent. 
so you you were mentioning different organizations that you've been a part of, um, you know, from campaigns for arts institutions for br bringing Dance Theater of Harlem to post apartheid South Africa, working mm -hmm. with George C. Wolfe at the Public Theater, um, <laughs> and the Broadway chants are of that on bringing the noise, bringing the funk. Mm -hmm. What have these efforts taught you about the arts and their value and humanity? That's well, what I've learned is people love the arts, wherever they are, wherever in the world. Because I, I travel to, to uh, Moscow, I do lectures there, I've been, I've been all over the world. Mm. And I find that people love the arts because in our heart, I believe we all are artists in some way. Mm -hmm. But it's how you treat it. It is how you respect it and how your, your life, your, you know, what you've accumulated is being acknowledged. So when that's squashed, when you're told that it's not important or mine is better, that's when I see the disconnect, you know. And so and that's part of white fragility, you know, thinking that I always have to be on top. My mind is always going to be better, you know, and I'll allow you in. And so that, that to me is one of the greatest barriers. In terms of value, I think the value is that we are all connected. Is the interconnectedness of life that is undeniable. One of the quotes that George Wolf used to say, you know, part of your story bleeds into mine, part of my story bleeds into yours. And it's that connection that really makes us all human. So no one lives in isolation. You know, art is not created just for that one person. It is to be shared and experienced. So the more we can acknowledge that and respect that, then I think that that, that value becomes what can lead the way and open the doors to greater engagement, long-term engagement. Wow, wow. So we're, we're kind of coming to the end now and I wanna ask this question of you. Um, what are some concrete steps to move forward and create connections in the communities we serve? I know you've touched on this a little bit, but what would you charge? What would be your charge to companies who are looking at making EDIA a part of their um, moniker and a part of what they stand on? So I would, if, if it's a nonprofit that's 501c3, I would make sure I'm engaging my board from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, not as an afterthought, but the board needs to do the work too. And so I would speak with them and, and tell them that this is what the direction we're going in. We need our board of directors to also be on par with us. So let's do this together. So that would be my first step. Second step would then to be to build a curriculum of learning. How are we going to do this? If you have a budget, you can bring someone in to guide you, great. If you can't, plenty of uh, free material that you can start to, to look at and incorporate. Um, and lots of free workshops also that the whole staff and board could look at together. So as you want to watch in this experience together, then you can, di you know, um, talk about it afterwards, you know, dissect that, unpack that and say, wow, did you get that point? Yeah. What did that mean? I don't know. So then you can read and follow up on that, create a timeline, you know, so we are starting, many, many people started their new fiscal year, July 1. What do we want to see accomplished in a year? So create metrics for success. What would that look like? Okay. Now we have more diverse staff. Okay, now that our, st our staff, when we talk about diversity, it's not just the ushers and the receptionists, but we've got managers, directors, VPs, you know, how, whatever the level is of leadership there. But that I'm mentoring a person of color. I'm being very intentional about that, you know. And then how am I looking at my audiences, my community? How, what partnerships am I creating? So there's a number of platforms you can start with right now, low-hanging fruit. Mm, wow. That is, I've... Learned so much from you today. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that our viewers have also learned so much from you. And we just want to thank you so much for, for being here. I'm going to ask um, Jessica to come back on and just kind of sign us off. But we are so appreciative of you and, and all of your work over the last, you know, your kind of your, so what I like to call your life's work and, and the amazing change yeah. that you've, that you've helped and made in, in the arts industry. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You were great. Thank oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> you were <are> too. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you both so much. I can't express how helpful this is and um, and how important this work is to be doing right now. So thank you, Donna. Thank you, Elliot. We appreciate it immensely. And I'd like to thank all of you at home for joining us this evening for The Dish. Be sure to catch us live next week on Thursday, August 20th at 6 p.m. for our Composer Dish. Director and producer Dean Anthony will host this event with composers in Kiro Okoye, Michael Ching, and Whitney George as they discuss how they get their new works performed in a preservationist field. This has been The Dish with River City Opera. We thank you again for joining us, and we wish you and your loved ones health and safety. Have a great night.